All right, folks. Welcome to our March meeting. I can't believe it's March already. Um, anyway, uh, I'm Pam Barber, your chapter president for the Upstate. Nice to see all of you. Appreciate you coming. Um, just a bit of housekeeping. We got refreshments in the back. Please make sure you help your yourself um, with that. Anytime, it's pretty informal around here. Restrooms, take a left right behind the main desk when you came in is uh, the restrooms. Also, if you take a right, there's restrooms on that side. It's about the same distance, so you can split it up either way. Um, another thing, uh, we have to be out of here by 8.30. And one thing of note, which I tend to forget to tell everyone, at 8.30, those doors out front lock. So if you go out that door after 8.30, you're not coming back in unless you got somebody standing there to let you in. Okay, because these folks go home here at the, the center. So just keep that in mind when it's time to go because um, I don't want anybody to get locked out. So make sure you take all your goodies with you, especially water bottles. Those tend to stack up in our lost and found. Um, let's see, announcements. We have a hike at Cane Creek uh, the, in the Jocasta Gorges coming up on March 23rd. I have no idea if it's full or not, but I think it's limited to 15 people. So if you want to join in on that, uh, be sure to register all the information's in the newsletter and on the website. So be sure to catch in on that. It's a really cool hike um, if you want to get more knowledge about the Jocasta Gorges. Beautiful spot, especially this time of year. We've got all kinds of uh, ephemerals starting to come into bloom. Uh, the Coney Bells, eh, they're probably still blooming, but eh, there might be a few left by then. Fig Buttercup. If everybody does or does not know about the Fig Buttercup, um, if you do know, share with everyone what you know. If you don't know, it's time to learn. This is a nasty plant that we've been trying to eradicate from Conesty and the Reedy River and anywhere in our area that we find it. Uh, we've had the fight going for I don't know how many years, but Bill Stringer and Janie Marlowe have been very, very vigilant about fighting this. And we've been raising funds again and again and again to help uh, get this plant under control and we've made some headway and we're kind of starting to creep up and win the battle, but we need leaders. We need folks to help uh, take over running this project and keeping the funds coming in and helping keep the contractors coming because every year we hire a couple of contractors to come in and help us do the spraying because um, some of us are getting a little older in years and uh, a little tough to carry around a sprayer and be out in the hot sun doing that job. But anyway, if you're interested in getting involved in eradicating invasives, yes, you keep going. Um, please let us know. My Maybe. email is upstatepresident at scmps.org. You can email me or anybody that you know in the organization like Judy Seeley or Jesse Freeman. Speaking of, would my board members that are here please stand up? This is Jesse Freeman in the black jacket. We got Judy Seeley here. We got Kathy McGurdy, who is our uh, native nursery manager. Jack, you can stand up too. You're not on the board, but you're important. He's new to our group. He's an outreach coordinator. You may see and hear from him more and more if you like to staff, help us staff events and tell everybody about the Native Plant Society. He's our guy. He's gonna be getting us out there and visible to more and more organizations. And then we have Heather up here. She's our program chair. Thanks folks. Um, I got one other announcement then I'm gonna turn it over to Judy. Um, plant sale. I know most of you are probably already aware the plant sale is happening this year on May the 11th. Um, it's a little later just because we had date conflicts, but we did make it happen. It's gonna be at Consti. The March newsletter went out. You can now sign up to volunteer for the plant sale. Lots and lots and lots and lots of jobs that we need filled. So if you haven't signed up already, please uh, jump on there and get your registration done so that we know where we can um, allocate time for you. Because we can, if it's just an hour or half a day, whatever you can do. The, the sale runs from nine to 11, but we need people on Friday the day before to help load and get plants over to the site. And then we need people after, um, I think it's nine to one, not nine to 11, nine to one. But after that, we will need folks to also help us break down and leave things as we found them. Okay, any other announcements before I turn it over to Judy to talk about the flyers? 
No? Going once, going twice. Judy? I'm here to get my golf pony show. <laughs> <laughs> On your table, there is at least one plant sale flyer sitting there. Plant sale flyer. And what I need you to do is I pick these up from the printer and they've been at my apartment in Clemson. They don't do us any good sitting in my apartment in Clemson. So there's a bunch of them back there on the table. I need you to take however many you could post at your church, school, uh, your friendly neighborhood restaurant, any place you know there's a, uh, a public bulletin board, library, libraries will usually put them up if you show them what it is. We are a not-for-profit organization, so they're usually happy to do it. I'd like you to take however many of these that you know you can post. They also don't do any good if you grab a handful and they sit in your car until May 11th, <laughs> which has been known to happen. So please, if you haven't done it yet, take some flyers from back there in the display and put them in your car with a roll of tape and maybe some push pins. And if you see a bulletin board, you say, oh, it will sit there. Take down one that's out of date, put yours in bed. Take your roll of tape into your favorite restaurant. You say, hey, I'm with this group. We're doing great work. May, may we put up one of these flyers in your restaurant window? And usually they'll say yes because they know you and you can come in there and spend money. So do it. And let's make this plant sale a great success. Okay, thank, you. thank you, Judy. Yeah, we need all the advertising we can get. So uh, they put together a great flyer. So let's put them to good use out there and plaster them all over the city. Sounds like a good plan. Um, one other announcement I forgot to make, which you'll hear more and more about, is that this year um, the Upstate is being charged with organizing and putting on the symposium um, for the state. Every year, one chapter um, is basically signs up to hold a symposium that is statewide, as opposed to like a meeting just for the Upstate. This reaches the entire state so that all chapters um, are invited. And this is our time to learn or teach others in the state about what we do in the upstate as a society. And so that's gonna be happening October 18th and 19th. Um, there was a nice write up in the newsletter about it. We haven't gotten all the planning done yet. It's gonna be at Table Rock at the Pinnacle Pavilion there. You will hear, hear more details as plans evolve. But if you want to hear some great speakers, go on hikes, um, on wildflower outings, all that kind of stuff. Um, I personally right now don't have any idea exactly what we're going to do, but we're going to we've started planning that. So as details unfold, we'll let you know. But it'd be a great way to meet some additional members and also get to know some of the area, here, here. especially if you're new to the upstate region. OK. All right. So I'm going to turn it over to Heather and let her get our spear going. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us tonight. So we are super excited to have Josie Newton speak tonight. Uh, she has been in her role as a Friends of Reedy River Watershed Scientist since August 2021. Her professional background is in stream and wetland delineation and permitting, as well as sustainable agriculture initiatives and riparian buffer management. Her engagement in watershed protection in our community goes beyond Friends of Reedy River. She's also a member of the Saluda River Basin Planning Council, the Reedy River Water Quality Group Best Management Practice Committee, the Reedy River Water Quality Group uh, Public Outreach Group, and is a South Carolina Adopt-A-Stream Freshwater and Microinvertebrate Trainer. Lots of words in all of those different organizations. I'm so sorry. It's okay, I chose to, I chose to. I needed some tongue twisters, some brain practice, it keeps my brain sharp. Uh, her passions lie in biodiversity protection, stream, wetland, and riparian zone conservation, providing equitable access to the outdoors, native plant conservation, and public education and outreach within these areas to promote community engagement and protecting the Reedy River watershed's invaluable resources. So with that, let's welcome Josie. Yeah. I'm going to try to put this up here somewhere where it won't fall over. But. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me this evening. I really appreciate it. And it's a pleasure to see so many familiar faces from volunteer events. Um, so thank you all for coming out. 
um, as Heather just did a fantastic job introducing me with all of the things that I usually use acronyms for. So you really took that on. Um, I, I've been with friends for about two and a half years now, um, and I always kind of describe my role with the group as organizing our boots on the ground projects. Um, so that would be anything from what we kind of just overall called plantings, aka stream bank stabilization projects, but they sound a lot more user friendly when you call them plantings because at their core, that's what they are. Um, and then invasive species removals. I also do monthly water quality monitoring outings and report on that. Um, that's also a volunteer opportunity. So if anyone's interested in adopting a stream near you, please get in touch with me as well. Um, I do our vo volunteer coordination, uh, the majority of it, and then river cleanups, uh, I do a lot of advocacy work, and again, public education is a big passion of mine, um, so I'm thrilled to be here this evening. Before I really get going, am I speaking at a volume that works for everyone in the room, or do I need to project more or less? Okay, <laughs> just wanted to check. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to give a shout out to our board of directors. Um, nothing that we do as an organization could be done without our board of directors, because I am our only full-time staff member. It is me and one other person. She is a part-time person, but may as well be full-time. Um, she handled, Her name's Mary Sillick, and she handles our partnership and resource development um, kind of outreach area of things. But it's just the one and a half of us on staff, and the rest is all supported by our dedicated board members. So I always love to give them the credit uh, as well, because they're very supportive of us. Um, I wanted to give a quick introduction. Am I doing that right? So I'm here. <laughs> I can advance with the arrows yeah. and stuff. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Wanted to give a quick introduction to uh, Friends of the Reedy River. We operate under three main pillars. The first is uh, education, then advocacy, and action. So with education, we really try to engage the community and educate folks on the importance of a healthy river system. We also do a good bit of advocacy work. Um, I know that your organization was also very much in favor of the riparian buffers regulation that just passed in Greenville County. Um, so we also had a big hand in that. Um, and then activating the community, we try to equip the community with tools and resources to take action. Um, and we are a volunteer-based, very small organization. So all of this, again, relies heavily on people coming out and volunteering with us and really supporting us. Um, as I know, the Native Plant Society also similarly operates with the greenhouse operations. So um, I also, I know that we might be broadcasting statewide this evening. So I wanted to kind of provide some context to the Reedy River for those folks that are not in this room that are tuning in. Um, we are in Greenville County and Lawrence County. So maybe even some people in this room, even though you might live here, a lot of people don't understand the extent of the Reedy. It starts up in Traveler's Rest and flows all the way down to Lake Greenwood where it joins with the Saluda River. Um, so it is started with spring fed tributaries and TR, goes through Greenville, but when we get to Greenville, we're only about a quarter of the way down into the watershed. Um, we could go through Lake Conesty, Boyd's Mill Pond, and then it joins again the Saluda. The Reedy has had um, quite a past. <laughs> it's not always been the beautiful centerpiece of downtown that we know it as today. Um, it's starkled through a period of industrial waste dumping. Um, for a long time, it was known as the Rainbow Reedy. Some folks in this room, if y'all are Greenville natives, you might remember a time where it would flow a different color every day or multiple colors in a day based on the textile dumping that was occurring. So this is a preserved postcard um, from 1905 showing kind of the downtown view of the Reedy River. You can see we think that the buildings are close to the Reedy nowadays. Look at how it used to be when it was a mill town instead. Um, so also with the Reedy, um, it was severely channelized in a lot of ways. And there was a lot of time spent kind of unnaturalizing the watershed and we're trying our best to get it back to a better natural functioning ecosystem now. Um, I guess the biggest change was that Previously, we were trying to change the river instead of designing with the river. So whereas in the past, we might've tried to straighten the channel because that got it out of the way. Now we see it as an amenity and something that we really need to focus on preserving. So it's come a long way, but still needs our help. So three of the main things that I wanted to focus on this evening are things that native plants really can help resolve. And that would be volume control and urban runoff, sedimentation and nutrient pollution. Make sure I'm not skipping over anything that I didn't have. Here we go. 
So the first thing is volume control. I just wanted to give kind of a quick snapshot of um, what the impacts can look like before we jump in to it. These are some photos that were actually taken on our stream bank failure, failure reporting tool. Um, so these are not from Google or Getty Images or anything like that. These are taken by, I believe our summer intern two years ago took these in the Reedy watershed. So just kind of keep this in mind as we go to the next couple of slides, but the Reedy struggles from severe lack of volume control, meaning that there are too few control measures in place to keep the flow of the river consistent, and it results in a very flashy system. And that is what we actually call it in, in the circle of water science people, we call it flashy, um, because it means that it's really likely to quickly cause a flash flood. Um, you can kind of think of control measures as speed bumps. It's something that slows the flow of the water and slows the runoff from even minor rain events um, and helps kind of check the speed of it as it enters the river. Let's see here. We often see very high flows. This is downtown Greenville in the photo here. I'm sure that y'all have all at some point been in downtown and seen the high flows like this. Um, but it's caused by an increase in impervious surfaces, including rooftops. That's something that's often overlooked. We we always kind of think, oh, it's just from you know pavement and everything like that. Of course, I gesture outside and there's grass, but um, we always think it's from pavement and roads, but it's also from rooftops. And um, there's very little area to hold or store the excess water. So it all hits the rooftop, it hits the ground and runs off into the river, causing these pretty big issues of volume control. Um, because of the Reedy's industrial history, again, many portions were manually straightened um, and kind of something that we use to explain this. It's like you're trying to fit a fire hose amount of water through a garden hose, which winds up with water flowing really hard and really fast through a really narrow channel. That's what happens pretty often in the Reedy. We wind up with these like really, really powerful flows that stir up all of the sediment, um, cause bank failure like we saw in the previous slide. Um, and, and there's really nothing checking it, which is why we need these native plants to be in place to help provide that volume control. If there, I wanted to mention too, if anyone has questions as we go, for my sake, I don't know if, how y'all need to do them, but you're welcome to just kind of ask them as we go through. I know sometimes it's easier as there's a photo up, if you have a question, please feel free to interrupt. But um, the negative impacts and results of volume control, um, banks collapsing. Again, these are photos from within the watershed within the last two years. Um, and that can lead to land loss. It can lead to incised and unstable banks, collapsed banks, undercut banks, which is what we see in that bottom photo. Um, and we've got yep, unstable banks le leading to land loss. This is especially an issue in Northern Greenville County. Um, and then high flows can stir up the sediment. So that's why all of the water in that photo is so murky and brown, that's stirred up sediment. And that can actually end up increasing our E. coli counts in the river. So it's not only an issue just you know, for the, the bank's sake and for nature's sake, it's also, a, it can cause a, a threat to human health as well, just in the terms of water quality. So things that can provide volume control, and this is where the things that y'all are interested in will come into play, um, properly graded banks that allow a river to have access to its floodplain, and then banks stabilized with native plants. Native plants, um, especially grasses, sedges, and trees or live stakes, uh, provide a good bit of bank stabilization. And then uh, having wetlands and floodplains with native plants to store the excess runoff is also beneficial. Um, it reduces runoff, it stores the runoff, it gets it back into the groundwater system instead of it all hitting the river uh, like a ton of bricks. And then riparian buffers uh, especially are important to slow the introduction of that runoff to the river and also stabilize the banks. And then one of the cause or one of the results also of volume control issues is sedimentation. So this is another more recent photo courtesy of City of Greenville. Um, and this is once again a result of high volume and very little control. You might have noticed that in a lot of the areas in, in where the river is accessible, there's not much of a riparian buffer. There's not that area of plants that's not mowed. And we need that to be at least 30 feet really at least a hundred feet in order for it to be most effective. It is, it's a little scary. <laughs> it is, so that that's downtown after a rainfall. Yes, <laughs> um, but when, when rain flows and is not interrupted and when we don't have buffers in place, we wind up with suspended sediment being introduced into the water. 
So that's the definition of sedimentation. It's, it's suspended sediments that are uh, we can then measure with turbidity readings, which is what our board member is doing in that photo there. Um, he is checking the turbidity, which is the clarity of the water. Uh, we report that monthly as well. Causes of sedimentation are lack of volume control. I know I've said that about four times now. Um, erosion and movement of in-stream sediment. So it's not just stuff coming from up the hill and washing down. It's also like we're losing pieces of the bank from inside of the stream bed. Um, stormwater runoff, loose, unstable soils, which again is where the native plants come in. When we have these bare banks, when we have areas that are not covered in plants that don't have these root systems in place to hold things together, it washes off and it creates these really turbid waters. And then a negative impact of sedimentation. Um, one of the other things I really care about is macroinvertebrates, which I often just describe as the critters that are in the stream. Um, when we have a lot of sedimentation, these little guys don't have any uh, ability to breathe because their gills can be clogged. Uh, we can also, again, deal with e uh, elevated E. coli levels and lower dissolved oxygen counts. Um, and I'm trying to think here, what's that? I wanted to provide a couple more photos. So the picture on the right is a transparency tube. That's what we do to measure the suspended sediments. Um, and then the photo on the left is something that we saw recently was very, very cloudy water um, after a pretty minor rainfall event. So it doesn't take much to really stir it up. And again, that is because of the heavily urbanized uh, environment and watershed surrounding the reedy. Um, we don't have a lot of areas with really strong buffers and we really need to, um, especially with native plants. The, the root systems of native plants differ significantly from the root systems of non-natives. A lot of the native grasses have really good kind of wide, deep gripping roots, whereas a lot of the non-native ornamentals will be kind of more surface level. They, they don't have that kind of grip. So we need native plants versus something that you could just, you know, pick up um, that's more ornamental because we really need something that is designed to be living in that area um, that has roots designed for these soils and that can do the job of holding that soil down. So even though, you know, you might pass a riverbank that's covered in kudzu or Japanese knotweed or something like that, it's a plant. It's better than nothing, but it's barely better than nothing. We really need natives instead. Yay, the picture is there. Thank you. <laughs> Had a time getting this little picture and the duck did not want to cooperate. Um, <laughs> the third thing that I wanted to discuss that um, can really be strongly impacted by having, or strongly improved by having native plants in a river corridor is nutrient pollution. Um, nutrient is a word that sounds really good when we're talking about it for people, but not so good when we're talking about it in this context. Um, nutrients are... Um, chemicals that we often find in commercial fertilizers, broadcast fertilizers like nitrogen and phosphorus. Those are two of the main issues that the reedy faces. Um, and they are also two of the main things that you'll find in your regular lawn fertilizer. So I'm not saying that fertilizers are all bad. I'm not saying that using fertilizer is bad, but it needs to be applied properly and at the right time. And you need to test your soil and make sure that it actually needs it. Um, so if you are using fertilizer, then it's not, not necessarily bad, but, um, we want to try to limit that. So one of the result or the main result of excess of nutrients in a water system is that algae, aquatic algae will grow faster than the environment can really take it. Um, so we wind up with these things called algal blooms, um, which harms water quality, habitats, food resources, and dissolved oxygen counts. The bacteria that dissolves the algae can also be toxic if in high volumes. So it, again, is an indicator of water quality and water health. Um, and it's directly related to whether or not there is a buffer of plants on either side of your waterway that can uptake those nutrients. So the nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, they're designed for plants to take. That's why we use them in fertilizer. That's also why we need a buffer because we need to keep them in plants and native plants do a really great job of being a natural filter to get these things out of the rainfall runoff that's coming down the hills and soaking it up and kind of sequestering it and using it so that we keep it out of the river um, and then the plants use it and we, we don't wind up with a system that looks like this. We never wanna see the Reedy River look like this or any of the tributaries or any of the, the ponds or anything on it. Um, and we think we've got everything covered on that one. Why we need native plants. Again, volume control. Um, we need to reduce runoff. We need to keep riverbank soils in their place. We also need to keep 
riverbank so or we need to keep soils from washing off into the first or in the first place excuse me i'm getting a little tripped up um <laughs> We need the nutrients from runoff and fertilizer application to be absorbed by these native plants. Native plants are also super beneficial for reducing runoff because they don't require as much regular irrigation. They're designed, and you all know this, they're designed to survive in the climate that we have. You also don't typically have to fertilize them as frequently, if at all. So we're not adding more of that uh, nutrient pollution to the ground in the first place. So you can kind of stop it at the source, and then you can also prevent any of uh, the wrongdoings of other areas in, in town from introducing uh, nutrients to your river system as well. Um, let's see here. Got volume control, runoff reduction, bank stabilization, natural nutrient filtration, capturing those sediments, which is something that I'm gonna talk about when we review some of our projects. Um, the plants that we have put in one of our projects, they were, designed to secure the riverbank as it was, but it's also designed to catch additional sediments, almost like a net when it would flood. So well, we'll get to it with the photos, but um, uh, another benefit of native plants, not only is kind of keeping things where they are, but also catching things and preventing them from moving farther downstream. Um, and then we have flood storage and water quality improvements overall. That's the big take home. So now I'm going to get to some of the events that we do that really focus on native plants. Um, this is just a brief sample of the things that we have uh, had going on in the time that I've been with friends, but um, you can see a lot of invasive plant pull. It's just as important to get rid of the invasives as it is to replace with the natives um, so that the natives have a chance to outcompete. Um, I'm trying to think if we had, we had a planting just last week. I don't know that the graphic made it up there. <laughs> but we'll kind of go into some of the main projects that Friends has done within the last five years or so. I don't have sight of a clock. How am I doing my time? You're great. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so the first thing that uh, I want to talk about, and this is kind of the briefest thing because we don't have a lot of photos of this one at this point, but um, this is the Gay Spray Grain Garden. It's back behind the YMCA, Kane Halter YMCA, where the Swamp Rabbit Trail uh, connection occurs. So I'm not sure if y'all are familiar with that, but as you're going from First Baptist down towards the Swamp Rabbit Trail, you'll still see some of these rocks, but they're uh, wonderfully covered up by a good many river oats at this point. Um, we've also got a lot of green and gold in there, um, but we used restructuring of a drainage system added in a lot of rocks um, to kind of filter in and slow that rainfall that is all running off from those big church parking lots and the YMCA parking lots. So that's an area, again, where those rooftops really come into play. Um, and we really needed to slow the introduction of that water coming down that hill before it hit the reedy. So you can see in the leftmost photo, we have some little plugs. Um, I'm having a hard time orienting myself. I think that might've been some of the chasmanthium, but um, and then we've got little plugs on the way down. Um, but at this point, this was about five years ago. At this point, when you go out there, it's primarily those river oats on the side. Um, and then the green and gold has really become expansive towards the bottom. It's very pretty. This is, so the, the Gay Spray Grain Garden was not one that I had the pleasure of actually being here for because it did happen before my time with friends, but um, this was one of the first projects that I got to do, and it was a floodplain planting or riparian planting um, near the intersection of McPherson and Ridgeland. Um, I'll go back to the slide, but for a little context, there we go. In this right picture, that um, road that you see back there is Ridgeland. And then if you were to pivot a slight bit to your left, you would be seeing the new bridge that they just built on McPherson. Uh, and a lot of people have dealt with traffic detours about that. So you might know where that is, but um, in December of 2021, we planted over 900 native plants in the site. It was all volunteer based. So we had a lot of volunteers come out and help us plant. And it was pretty easy in this alluvial soil. You can see it's very sandy. Um, and we were dealing with a lot of runoff and erosion in this area um, and also with really, really high flows. So this is a pretty busy area of the Reedy. Um, it kind of narrows out a little bit. Uh, this is downstream of downtown. And so we wind up with really, really high volumes with a lot of sediment rushing over here. So floodplains are designed to flood. We designed this and we wanted this to have submersion sometimes. 
Um, we we knew that that was going to happen. So I remember after like the second big rain that we had after this was planted, everyone was like, oh my gosh, you can't see any of the plants. They're covered in sediment. And I was like, yeah, that's what it's for. <laughs> that's, that's the goal. Um, so you can see these plants are in that sandy soil. Um, we wrapped the coir matting around the toe of the bank and stapled it in. Um, and so the coir matting is there to secure what's already there and also to catch stuff that is being stirred up and being carried down by the flow of the water. When you go out there now, number one, those junkets are huge, um, which is very happy. I'm very happy to see that. Um, they're also covered in a good bit of sediment. The idea was to build the bank up instead of letting it wash out. So we wanted to see those alluvial deposits happen. We wanted to see that sediment build up and up and up so that it was being caught and staying put instead of rushing downstream. I figured that this is the group of any that might appreciate a plant list. Um, so I work really closely with Rick Huffman. Um, I have actually since I was in college. So I'm very thankful to him for, for getting me involved in this in the first place. But he's an emeritus member of our board. Um, and he helps me with a lot of our planning of these, yeah, these items and these plantings. Um, there's little spots. Take a second. Put a plant 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 marble at the plant list, but, um, yeah. These are all designed to have wet feet. Again, this was a floodplain so planting, the riparian planting. Critters. So we wanted stuff that would thrive in that riparian it's environment. Box, it also box. kind mm -hmm. of tapers up to a bit of a prairie. Um, so that's why we have some things that prefer dry feet. Um, so we had kind of two levels of the site, and I wish I had better photos that showed the grade a bit better, but we had kind of a first bench that was the floodplain and then more of a prairie area where we did a seed mix. And it was a native rain garden seed mix from our seed. Yes. To do the planting? In, uh, about three and a half hours. <laughs> yeah. We had a lot of volunteers. Yeah. Yeah. It was... Um, a bit of a haul, quite literally, to get the plants in. Um, I actually wound up driving with our now board president down to Baker Environmental um, down in Georgia with a U-Haul, and <laughs> we picked up most of these plants. Um, so that was an adventure, but <laughs> but we we made it and we got them. And I think you can see that U-Haul up there in that, <laughs> that right hand corner. Um, but yeah, we we getting the plants in tends to all. Or, I'm sorry, when I say it, and I don't mean in the ground, I mean physically in our care is usually the hardest part, um, which, and I wanted to give a massive shout out to the Upstate Native Nursery, to all of y'all, um, especially Kitty Putnam for helping me source the plants for nearly all of the projects that we've done at this point that I've been involved in um, because we don't have wholesale access and because I'm not a professional plant purchaser. I'm, I'm getting there, but I'm not there. Um, I really lean heavily on the Native Plant Society to advise me on either if y'all have plants in the nursery that I can use and purchase, we do that. If not, then uh, typically Kitty will help me um, find nurseries nearby that are good at helping me source the things that we need. I've worked uh, now with Blue Oak Horticulture at the Native Plant Society's recommendation. They've even offered to do specialty grows for us as well. And so it's just the connections that y'all help um, small other nonprofits like us make is invaluable. Um, and I don't think that I could have pulled off organizing a project like this without the help of the folks in this room. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, about three and a half hours to actually get them in, including putting out the quarter matting. So that's another look. Um, you can see again, the junkus is super prevalent. We also put in some of the ITO, which is some of the shrubs and some of the button bush. Um, and then I'm trying to think of where this is. I'm not sure that there is visible, but we put a good bit of goldenrod through here as well, but I believe they were plugs, uh, maybe smaller. And then we did a phase two planting for this project as well. Um, again, I was actually mentioning today as we were kind of gearing up to do another upcoming event and project, we typically have to do a phase one planting and then see how things do. And then if something didn't actually like having wet feet as much as we thought it would, or if we didn't know that it was going to be the type of um, flow pattern rushing over it that we thought it would, we have to go in and kind of you know, edit and repair as needed. So this was phase two of that same project. Um, and we just kind of uh, me and Rick went out and evaluated what we had, what was coming up, what looked good, what we needed to to change, and this was our second round at that planting. Yeah. Um, this was in this was uh, two years ago to the day, um, so it was about four months after the initial planting. So we planted pretty late in December, 
Um, most things took, but the things that didn't, we just, we figured out what we could change out. Another project and what y'all would have seen most recently on our social media is the work that we've been doing out at Cleveland Park Stables. Um, in 2018, we worked to install the rain gardens that are out there. Um, so there's a number of rain gardens, we'll get a photos of those in a bit, but um, in 2021, we worked to uh, rest restore the riparian buffer and we installed uh, 215 native plants. A lot of that was river oat and mountain mint kind of to the right of where the folks are standing in this photo um, and conducted some invasive species management. And by that, we mean kudzu removal in that back area um, and then added some live stakes also on the bank. Harassing. Another important thing that we do at a good many of our projects or try to do at our projects is install signage because the work we do is great, but it's even better when people know about it and when they can take that home and take that knowledge with them. Um, so this is an example of a sign that's out at Cleveland Park Stables. And then also whenever we do a planting, there's maintenance involved. You can't just necessarily plant it and go. Oh, so we typically now have been starting with like a three year care period for any project that we install, where during that three year period, we'll go in and do invasives management, which we just mobilize a pretty big group of volunteers every now and again and get people out there to pull things. And we found it's easiest at Cleveland Park Stables to get groups to focus on certain plants. So we'll get like half of them focusing on camper weed and half of them focusing on uh, the grass and just have people find one thing, be able to identify that one thing and then go at it. Um, so we have these volunteer events. Um, we do typically get very good volunteer turnout for those as well. So once again, could not do the work we do without our volunteers. Um, but invasive species management is equal parts as important as installing the new natives. These are some photos from uh, removal at Cleveland Park Stables. So the photos in this slide are from one of the larger areas. It's not a proper rain garden. It's more just a riparian garden. So it's it's not designed with under drainage or anything like that, but it is kind of the first line of defense because this is on the uphill end of Cleveland Park Stables. Um, so we have volunteers out there pulling everything and you can see some fresh mulch beneath their feet. The city, uh, we work with a great partnership with the city of Greenville for them to kind of come in and mulch after we have done projects and organized projects. They're always out there working with us. You can see their truck, um, but we have a really good partnership um, where we kind of say, hey, we need, we need your assistance with this. And then they say, hey, we need you to come out here and do this kind of thing. So um, could not do anything that we do without the partnerships that we've got. And then these photos are from last Thursday. So it's been a busy couple of weeks, um, but we planted about 250 native plants over at Cleveland Park Stables. Um, all of the pink flags that you can see are where the new plants were going. So I worked with Rick Huffman and then Holly Owings at Earth Design to plan out where we were gonna plant what plants. And then I worked to order them in again with help from Kitty Putnam and the Native Plant Society. Um, got a lot of those plants in um, and had volunteers out there. We did not have a huge volunteer group for this one because it was on a Thursday morning um, and weekday mornings are difficult for folks to necessarily be able to get out there. But even with a relatively small group of volunteers, folks were able to get all these planted within about an hour and a half. So uh, it was it was a great turnout um, and very happy with how it looks. I believe that the city is leaving those pink flags out there for a bit just to kind of help everyone on the cruise familiarize themselves with what we planted and where. So if y'all are out and about in Cleveland Park and happen to drive by Cleveland Park Stables and see those flags, feel free to stop by and see what we planted. We labeled all of them uh, or nearly all of them. Um, so if you're, you're interested in checking it out, please do so. This is our plant list from that planting last week. We have yellow Indian grass at the back of that largest bed um, and then the plugs of purple love grass in the largest bed. And then nearly everything else except for the chasmanthium went into this very front bed. So that's, if you walk in from the parking lot, that's to your immediate right when you come in. Give folks a second to look at that. I know that y'all care about it. And it's so nice to be in a room of people that actually care about these things. like <laughs> It depends. So um, with the yellow Indian grass, the uh, sorghastrum nutans, we put that typically farther uphill. Um, so at the stables project that we did last week, that was on that back edge 
of the not technical rain garden, but riparian garden um, at the Cleveland, we call it Cleveland Point, just kind of internally at this planting. Um, they were actually kind of farther up towards Ridgeland. Um, so they were on the uphill upslope end of things because they don't need feet as wet, but they do uh, handle that sandy soil pretty well. Um, and they've done really well at, at both sites. Get back to that list. Did that answer your yeah. question? Okay. So yeah, not everything has wet feet, but just because it's not submerged in water doesn't mean it's not equally as important to have to stabilize that soil, filter out those nutrients. Um, and it's also important for us just aesthetically to have different height levels. Um, and it's helpful, again, with sediment capture to have different different levels of, of plants out there as well. Combination. How do we pick it? Um, I mean, a lot of it is dependent on just the, the wet tolerance, the water tolerance of them. Again, I worked with um, Holly Owings and Rick Huffman, both of them from Earth Design, um, and they really helped figure out the plant list. So we were kind of, with this planting, we were kind of going and doing that phase two or phase three at this point, replanting. Um, so they, we used to have some like cardinal flower in this bed, um, and that was kind of taking, but it would easily get covered up with mulch and then just would not survive. Um, in that context. So we had to put in something a little bit hardier. Um, so a lot of it is just tolerance levels. Um, and then again, trying to focus more on like the grasses and sedges because they provide the best water quality benefits and really help get that water in the ground. Um, that's, that's what we look at most. Any other questions about this? Yes. How did your Planning fair. We have we've had a couple of recent flood events. They've How are those planning fair. They've done very well. Did any did a lot of get washed away or did they do fine? They did fine, um, especially with the one that was actively on a floodplain. Um, again, I was holding my breath with that one because it was pretty iffy. You can see, I don't know that you can actually see, but we had some iris actually planted. Like if this is the bank, we had some like down underneath where you can even see in these photos. Um, a good many of those lasted because we had that coir matting in place. So instead of cutting the matting apart, we would just have volunteers kind of part the the uh, the gaps in it and then push them back together to resecure it. We also used I think 14 inch long metal staples to secure the matting. And on some of those plants that we were like, oh, this is iffy on if it's going to stay, we used a metal stake to also kind of anchor that in. And then I went back out and removed a good many of those once they had their feet secure. <laughs> so they've, they've done surprisingly well. Again, panic inducing, but surprisingly well. <laughs> Um, I know over, this was not our project, but our office is on the Rewa campus over on Malden Road. Um, so I'm very close to the Reedy and close to the projects that they do. Um, but they did a project pretty recently, I guess about a year or so ago, um, right before we had some pretty major flooding as well. And they theirs did very well too. Um, again, it's, it's that that root structure of those plants and their ability, because the grasses and sedges are not so rigid, they're able to kind of flex with the flow of the water, um, which I think is also something that makes them a lot more resilient than some of the other species that you might see. Good questions, thank y'all for asking. I think I had one more slide just to kind of, yep. That was, so again, kind of mentioning the, the buffers regulations earlier in the presentation, but, um, another thing that we really try to do is advocacy work, um, educating about buffer ordinances, encouraging and empowering sustainable development decisions, and working with developing entities to protect and restore wetlands. Um, we often, thankfully, have folks, developers approach us kind of asking, you know, what's, what's your take on this? Can you advise what we should do? Um, and we really appreciate folks reaching out and trying to get us involved. Um, and then with the buffer campaign, you can see in that top photo, that's kind of a group of all of us, uh, the core team that was trying to lead some of the engagement there with Rick Huffman in the back, kind of hidden, um, but working as the liaison to the Native Plant Society. Um, but we had members of South Carolina Environmental Law Project, Upstate Forever, Save Our Saluda, Friends of the Reedy, and Native Plant Society, um, all trying to fight that fight together. Um, so. Something I, again, wanted to harp on is just how impactful it is when we do work together and when we do try to pr 
present this very united front publicly, um, especially on issues like buffers that impact us all, and they're all in our best interests. Um, so I really appreciate everyone's support from, from y'all's group, from our group, from any of the groups that are in that photo. Um, uh, yeah, we could not have done that without everybody's help. <laughs> it was a big win. Um, and with that, I just wanted to just throw up a QR code for anyone to scan and um, please take a photo of this and, and get in touch and stay in touch with me. I'd, I'd love to have y'all out at some of our volunteer events. We actually have one of our largest events um, that happens twice a year coming up on April 13th. It's our spring river cleanup. We have one in the spring, one in the fall, um, typically have anywhere from 200 to 250 volunteers at these across I think this time we have five different sites. Sometimes we get up to eight different locations along the watershed. Um, they're a lot of fun. We have people that come out year after year, wear the same t-shirts and stuff like that. And um, would love to have y'all out there. And um, we have some, some other events that are gonna be coming up relatively soon as well. So thank you all so much for your time. And if anyone has any questions, please, please let me know. Yes. What were the old preparing books? And what is the new one? And how does it impact what's already there? Sure. Yes. So the question was um, about the riparian buffer uh, regulation. So it was a, the, the new one now enforces that there must be a minimum 50 foot wide riparian buffer on all waters of the state um, in Greenville County. And on waters, this is hard to explain without having a diagram sometimes, but on waters that drain an area of, I believe 50 acres or more or hundred acres or more, you have to have a buffer of a hundred feet. So it, it, it brings it up from having relatively no regulation and no minimum aside from just kind of the core regulations to having countywide enforced regulations of bare minimum 50, in most cases, a hundred feet. What was it previous? It was uh, barely regulated previously. So I don't I don't know that there was anything in place uh, at the county level, but the county is not the only regulator. So you also have like the Army Corps of Engineers um, and then anything that was incorporated. So this is an unincorporated Greenville County. Anything that was incorporated in a municipality or in a city would have and likely would have had its own set of regulations for within city limits. City. County. This is county. When does the Corps of Engineers involved? This actually used to be my old job. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of an involved question. Anytime that you might have an impact to a waters and waters is a wetland or a stream, you have to have either a consultant or you have to go directly through the Corps to have someone go out and delineate the boundaries of any streams and wetlands. So for a wetland to be a wetland, it's not just, oh, there's water, it's a wetland. You have to have hydrology, soils, and vegetation. Um, so in my old old role, I was a consultant doing that work. Um, so people would, uh, engineers or design firms would hire consultants. We would go out into the field, take data sheets and a lot of photos and produce these reports and then send those off to the Army Corps of Engineers for them to do a desktop evaluation in most cases. Oftentimes they would also come out and do on-site evaluations with us just if there was anything that was iffy. And that's to determine if it's jurisdictional or non-jurisdictional under the US Army Corps of Engineers. So it's a very, it's a lot of, a lot of layers to that question. Um, but anytime that anyone's going to build a structure or uh, put a pipe through a stream or, um, do some sort of design work where you're having to drive heavy machinery through a stream, anything where you might be impacting a wetland or changing the in-stream structure should require a delineation and a report to the core. Any other questions? So the buffer, that would be for any development that would happen? Like if someone wanted to build like an apartment complex mm -hmm. or any of the examples you just shared, it's mm -hmm. like they have to have a buffer between where they start and the stream. You right? have to have a buffer between the disturbed area and the stream, yes. So you can't go in and just clear cut down to the stream. Um, there is buffer averaging allowed. So it doesn't have to be, you know, foot by foot, a hundred feet all the way around. There is some averaging allowed. Um, but overall, it needs to be that 50 foot minimum or 100 feet, depending on the, the drainage area.
New, new only. Old, it does not apply to old. And any, anything I'm saying is through the view of Friends of the Reedy River. I don't work for the county. I don't do their permitting. Um, so you can take my word for just personal knowledge, but this is not, not me giving any sort of legal advice by any means. <laughs> Question, Pam? <laughs> It did. It impacted the minimum lot size for septic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was. They were in the. There weren't. And it. Um, there was a little bit of back and forth. And because that's not as much my wheelhouse, that's not as much what I was prepared to speak on. But, um, but yeah, they were they were in the same amendment, um, which, you know, was a little bit of a challenge, but um, got it through, fortunately. <laughs> So when did you say the cleanup was? The cleanup is on April 13th, um, and it is in the morning. So we'll have check-in from about 8.30 to 9, and then the cleanup from 9 to 11. And then we have an after party over at Southern Side Brewing as well. Um, so it's a lot of fun, every, even if you're not in the same location as everyone, even though we have 200 people spread across a pretty wide area, we do have an after party for everyone. And it's a lot of fun to just get everyone out there and celebrate our hard work. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and I, I will say registration for that is filling up very quickly. I opened it on Monday or yesterday around five o'clock. And by the time I logged on this morning around seven, we had 70 people already signed up. Um, so we're already at about uh, half capacity. So if you're interested in coming out, please sign up as soon as possible so that you can get the site that you would like to be at. <laughs> Yeah, so they can take the question oh, if they want to. They have to take the question. <laughs> um, so, will you go back to the slide with the old post touch? <laughs> I think it would be great. Oh, there we go. Is that is that Falls Park now? Is that the like? Is that what Falls Park is now? I'm not 100% sure just because of the amount of change. This, so the question was, is that false part now? Um, I'm not 100% sure of the, the perspective of this. I wish that I had included some of the other photos where you could see it better. Um, but yeah, our, our river, unfortunately, has dealt with a lot of restructuring. Um, I know that we're not familiar with any areas that have that much of a, a pool at the bottom of them now. Um, but over the years with erosion and channels, uh, being forcibly moved or moved by erosion. So by forcibly, I mean a lot of times um, regulatory agencies back in the day would just think it's if it needs to be a river needs to be straight so that the water can move as efficiently as possible because we saw rivers as a way to get rid of stuff, which is why the Greenville uh, city of Greenville sewer system up until 1928 just dumped directly into the reedy untreated sewage so that it would just be there and then gone and then it's no one's problem and same with the industrial waste from the textile mills um so a lot of that uh we dealt with a lot of channel altering um again which is also what you see at unity park um has anyone been to unity park and seen like the wetlands preserve that's to the back of it that's actually where the reedy river used to run um so the groundwater that's happening back in those preserved wetland areas that is the natural bed, that's the base flow of the original Reedy River. It was moved in, I believe, 1928 to accommodate the railroad tracks uh, that is now the Swamp Rabbit Trail. <laughs> um, and then the commons is an old building. So the only reason that the commons can be as close to the river as it is is because it was an original building um, that was not subject to those permits that we now have um, and now have to, to uh, abide by. But that's a prime example of how, you know, you can look at a picture of the Reedy River exactly at the commons from back in the day, uh, from back in, you know, 1905, is that when this, yeah, 1905, and it would be, you know, two or 300 feet off. It would be in a totally different location because that's how we treated rivers. We, again, we saw it as something that we needed to, de to design to work with us rather than something that we needed to design around and work with. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I brought a couple of like flyers and stickers um, that are on this back table back here. Um, also, if you are interested in receiving our emails, um, I brought a little sign up sheet. So please jot down your name and email address. Please write legibly. I have to enter them. <laughs> um, 
and, and it's sometimes hard to make it out. And I know that I get a lot of error, cannot be delivered emails just because I straight up couldn't read what people had written. So if you're interested in receiving our emails, that includes event uh, announcements, registration updates, our monthly newsletters. Um, if you're interested in receiving the monitoring reports or becoming a water quality volunteer, um, just put a monitoring little note next to your name and I'll be happy to get in touch with you about that as well. Um, you know, we've got some flyers, some info about riparian buffers, also got grease can lids back there. So when you're cooking, um, if instead of dumping your uh, fats, oils, and greases down the drain, please put those just in an empty aluminum can and use one of those grease can lids back there to cap it, keep it in your freezer when it's full, throw it away, keep the lid and reuse it. Um, that's something that I deal with, not related to native plants so much, but because um, we don't want to deal with ruptured pipes introducing uh, foreign materials into the reedy as well. So um, please take a look back there. I'll stand back there and if anyone's interested in coming over to talk, I'd be happy to chat with you. Um, but thank you all so much for having me here this evening. And thank you for all the hard work that you all do. Um, and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you. I'll put the slide back up with my contact. Here we go. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Next month, we've got Adam Bigelow. We're going to be our speaker. We're going to be our speaker. We're going to be our speaker. We're going to be our speaker.